start right now. So let's. Let's. All right. Let's. Um. All right. Let's get started then. Do you want to go first? Sure. Yep. I mean, I don't care, but I'm, I'm happy to go first. Okay. Um. All right, so I do have one announcement to make, which is that the third panelist who was intending on joining us via Skype, um, he's never going to be physically present, Tom Bin, um, had an emergency, his fiance broke her foot and they had to go to the ER, so he's not even able to stand. He's not able to attend, but also not able to Skype. And um, that means that there will be more time um, for our panelists, uh, who I will introduce now uh, briefly. Um, ben Lewis of the Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, Provisional Central Committee, and Tom Riley of the International Bolshevik Tendency. Um, and the topic for uh, this panel I'll introduce briefly, and then I'm going to try to represent um, in the most recent uh, sort of instantiation of this Fang Bin critique of um, the International Socialist Tradition, the ISO in the U.S., and the SWP Britain's interpretation of Lenin, I'm going to try to represent how he's um, articulated his interest in raising this issue in the context of Occupy. So the title of this panel is Lenin and the Marxist Left After Occupy. Um, and I just want to just say that the occasion for this um, is, in fact, uh, unfortunately, our missing panelist, Fondin's recent critique of Tony Cliff's biography of Lenin, um, which was written in the 1970s. It's a multi-volume uh, biography of Lenin. And that uh, critique by Fan Bin um, was circulated on the web, first on Louis Proyek's um, The Unrepentant Marxist blog, and then republished in the Communist Party of Great Britain's Weekly Worker. Um, and the responses, an ongoing debate that took place, uh, the occasion for this discussion of Lenin, um, by um, representatives of the ISOUS, uh, namely Paul LeBlanc, who's a scholar of, of this period of Marxism, and Paul D'Amato, who's one of the leading members of the ISO United States. Um, and this panel discussion is, is meant to be focused on the political tasks of the left in the present, in the present moment, especially after the emergence of Occupy, in light of the history of Marxism, and Lenin's place in that history, specifically the present paralysis or rearguard character, apparently, of the Marxist left in the Occupy moment, as well as the preponderance of anarchism and anarchist political sentiments in Occupy, uh, needs to be addressed in light of Lenin's mixed and highly contentious legacy. In other words, Lenin still... Um, even in his apparent irrelevance, still makes an appearance um, on the stage. And so the question hanging over uh, this panel discussion, uh, Lenin and the Marxist left after Occupy, is what is to be done with Lenin? What is to be done with Lenin and with this historical legacy? Um, so let me represent, in, in Fang, Fang Bin's um, absence, let me represent... Uh, his very briefly represent um, what he had to say about why he was motivated since last summer, before the emergence of Occupy, but then also through the experience of Occupy in which he participated in Occupy Wall Street in New York. Um, and then during a kind of quiescent period of Occupy, namely the winter, he took it upon himself to return to this project he had started last summer of critiquing um, specifically Tony Cliff's biography of Lenin, and specifically the international socialist tradition in the interpretation of Lenin uh, in the 1970s, um, what was motivating this. And specifically what he said in his most recent article um, is that uh, the question of politics, the political party, and political form has been raised by um, Occupy. So in other words, uh, he interprets um, Lenin not to be a vanguardist in the sectarian sense, right, in the sense of a political organization that acts as the vanguard for the movement, um, but rather he interprets Lenin as someone who's very much concerned with political form, and that something like Occupy is such a political form. In other words, is a kind of vanguard of democratic struggle 
and um, the struggle against capitalism and to achieve socialism, etc. And in that respect, um, this reinterpretation of Lenin that um, Van Bin was taking up um, has also found uh, expression elsewhere, namely in Lars Lee's um, uh, retranslation and interpretation of what is to be done, as well as his political biography of Lenin, recently published. Um, and also in some of the work um, done around the Communist Party of Great Britain in terms of looking at um, Lenin's relationship to Second International Marxism, um, the Kautskyan conception of Marxism, and uh, the party understood quite differently than what came to be understood um, later um, in the subsequent history of quote-unquote Leninism. Um, the other point that I would make that I would add that Van Bin didn't really raise, um, but that I think is important, um, with respect to Tony Cliff's biography of Lenin, um, looking back to the 1970s, because I think it bears on the question of Occupy, um, namely, if we think about the crisis, like the 2008 crisis, um, and its ramifications, in similar terms to the crisis of the 1970s, then this Tony Cliff kind of international socialist tradition made a deliberate turn in the 1970s away from what they had, how they had conceived of their Marxism in the 60s, namely as a kind of a Luxembourgism, and shifted in the 70s to an avowed Leninism. In other words, Tony Cliff himself, in taking up this multi-volume biography of Lenin in the 70s, was ostensibly motivated by um, a kind of renewed currency, a renewed relevance of Lenin, um, that was widely shared. In other words, in the 1970s, you had a Marxist-Leninist turn. You had a kind of growth of Maoism as well as of Trotskyism. You had a kind of return to Leninism. And that the difference in the post-2008 moment is the conspicuous absence of the of currency and relevance of Lenin. And so I just want to sort of put that out there as um, you know, further informing the occasion for this discussion. Um, so let me turn it over to the panelists. Um, which of you will go first? Tom. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, as Chris suggested, uh, we are indeed living in peculiar times. The Marxist critique of the irrationality of production for profit has really been powerfully vindicated on a daily basis. Capitalism has become such a dirty word in the popular mind that the Republican candidates are advising each other not to use it during the campaign. Um, it really, what this signifies is that the, the popular legi legitimacy of the existing social order is um, as, as low as it has been, at least since the 1930s. Yet, the organized left has never been weaker in terms of its numbers, its influence, and the ability to project a vision of a plausible alternative to the endless horrors of the free market. So that's obviously a very contradictory situation we find ourselves in. Now, we believe that the struggle to politically rearm the left and to lay the basis thereby for a resurgent revolutionary workers' movement must begin by assimilating the essential lessons, both positive and negative, of the generations of revolutionaries who preceded us. Above all, this means studying the lessons of October 1917, the only successful workers' revolution in history. Now, we've got very little time today for such an enormous topic. So let me begin with what I think is the bottom line, and that is this. The essential precondition for the success of the Bolshevik Revolution was the recognition of the necessity to split the workers' movement. That is, for revolutionaries to organize themselves separately from opportunists, from centrists, and reformists. James P. Cannon, who is, in my opinion, the best communist leader that America has produced so far, contrasted Lenin's role with that of Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg, and he said the following. Trotsky's greatest error, the error which Trotsky had to recognize and overcome before he could find his way to unity with Lenin, was his insistence that the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks had to unite. Lenin's policy was vindicated in life. Lenin built a party, something that Luxemburg was not able to do with all her great abilities and talents something that Trotsky was not able to do because of his wrong estimation of the Mensheviks. Trotsky explicitly acknowledged the same thing in the first chapter of his 1920 
nine book, Permanent Revolution, he said the following, I believed that the logic of the class struggle would compel both the Bolshevik and Menshevik factions to pursue the same revolutionary line. The great historical significance of Lenin's policy was still unclear to me at that time. His policy of irreconcilable ideological demarcation and when necessary split for the purposes of welding and tempering the core of a truly revolutionary party. Now Trotsky was a bit slow to absorb that lesson as we all know. Yeah, it didn't, he'd been in the movement a long time by 1917 when he finally came around to Leninism. But once he learned it, he never forgot it. And the left opposition, which alone represented the heritage of Bolshevism through the Stalinist nightmare, was built on the basis of putting program first, as Trotsky said. This was Lenin's conception from relatively early on, that a re revolutionary organization has to be composed exclusively of revolutionaries. That is, people who understand and agree with the Marxist program and who are also prepared to act in a disciplined fashion to carry it out. The famous split of the 1903 RSDLP Congress between the Menshevik Sofs and the Bolshevik Hards over this question prefigured the eventual division over whether to support or overthrow Kerensky's bourgeois provisional government in 1917. The Leninist conception of democratic centralism is based on full freedom of discussion internally, including the right to modify the program and change the leadership. That's the democratic part. The centralist element involves the duty of all members to carry out the decisions of the majority, even those decisions that they personally may not agree with, until they're able to win a majority to reverse them. Now, some people, including the CPGB uh, comrades, consider themselves Leninists, but they think it's fine for members to disagree with each other in public. The CPGB also has a unique distinction of claiming the Leninist tradition while also embracing the renegade Kautsky. Lenin derided this kind of broad church approach as swamp building, and we agree with him. But to each their own, and the comrades are certainly welcome to Kautsky, as far as we're concerned. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, we're here today because of the ripples caused by comrade Bin's uh, critique of the first volume of Tony Cliff's biography of Lenin. Cliff, of course, was neither a great writer nor an outstanding historian. <laughs> and his book would really be of very little interest if it wasn't for the fact that he was the founder leader of the International Socialist Tendency, a group that can certainly never be accused of putting program first in our estimation. <laughs> Cliff deserted the Trotskyist movement in 1950 when, under the pressure of the Cold War, he refused to defend North Korea and Red China against the military attack of U.S. imperialism and a, and a coalition of fellow imperialist powers and, and various uh, vassals. For most of the next two decades, the IS uh, was buried in Britain's Social Democratic Labour Party. And during that time, in 1959, Cliff published a study of Rosa Luxemburg, which is kind of interesting and it gives some insights into the uh, Cliff's approach to politics that I think is significant. He applauded her early conception of revolutionary organization, which was premised on the notion that somehow the working class will be able to overthrow capitalism and more or less spontaneously take and wield state power without a general staff providing direction and providing leadership. Luxembourg at this time, of course, was operating as the leader of the left-wing faction, a very small faction, uh, in the mass reformist German Social Democratic Party. Cliff contrasted Luxembourg's model of revolutionary organization to Lenin's, and in, do, in his conclusion was the following, and I'm quoting, for Marxists in the advanced industrial countries, Lenin's original position can much less serve as a guide than Rosa Luxemburg's, unquote. Now in 1968, the International Socialists reprinted Cliff's book. And of course, by this time, Lenin was rather more in vogue than he'd been in 1959, and so the offending passage was simply excised from the text, which appeared in total apart from that. Um, of course, that's not how serious Marxists operate, but it's pretty typical of Cliff and the political tendency that he led. Uh, I think there's a lot to object to in Cliff's biography of Lenin, but I think that for the most part, uh, Comrade Bin and I don't share the same criticisms. 
I do not agree, for example, with his assertion that the original 1903 split with the Mensheviks was not particularly important. And for people who haven't recently read his critique, I'll quote from it. Quote, if Lenin did not mention the issue in his discussion on the principal stages of the history of Bolshevism in left-wing communism and infantile disorder, written for foreign communist audiences unfamiliar with RSDLP history, it could not have been a terribly important issue from his point of view. I thought, well, uh, that's, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, anyone who doesn't think that Lenin, in Lenin's view, the split with the Mensheviks was an important issue. But uh, when I went to look at the book that he'd cited as evidence of this, I found the following rather astounding things. This is, I've got a few quotes from chapter two. Uh, fifth paragraph of chapter two uh, begins, as a current of political thought and as a political party, Bolshevism has existed since 1903, period, i.e., since the split with the Mensheviks. Uh, a couple of paragraphs further begins, on the one hand, Bolshevism arose in 1903 on a very firm foundation of Marxist theory, calm, after the split with the Mensheviks, as a result of the fight with the Mensheviks. Several paragraphs later, on the other hand, Bolshevism, which had arisen on this granite foundation of theory, went through 15 years of practical history, 1903 to 1917, unequaled anywhere in the world in its wealth of experience. Lenin seems from this, I think, to think 1903 has a certain significance. In the chapter that Comrade Bin cited specifically, which is entitled The Principal Stages in the History of Bolshevism, the first part of that chapter is entitled The Years of Preparation for Revolution, 1903 to 1905. And let me uh, take a couple of significant sentences from this. Representatives of the three main classes, the three principal political trends, the liberal bourgeois, the petty bourgeois democratic, concealed behind social democratic and social revolutionary labels, and here the Marxist Internet Archive has a note for anybody who doesn't know what the petty bourgeois trend behind social democratic label. It's labeled Mensheviks. <laughs> and of course, that's what Lenin meant. And of course, the proletarian revolutionary is the third. That's the working class tendency. And of course, even the Marxist Internet Archive knows that the audience will understand that that's the, uh, the Bolsheviks. So those are the three trends. The, these... These uh, representatives in their struggles, Lenin says, to continue, anticipated and prepared the impending open class struggle by waging a most bitter struggle on issues of program and tactics. This is in the 1903-1905 period. All the issues on which the masses waged an armed struggle in 1905 to 1907 and 1917 to 1920 can and should be studied in their embryonic form in the press of the period. All the issues on which the masses waged the armed struggle, 1905-1917, can and should be studied in their embryonic form in the press of the period, i.e. in the 1903 polemics against the Mensheviks. Now, how Comrade Bin can reach a conclusion <coughs> citing that chapter that Lenin didn't consider the 1903 split to be a terribly important issue uh, is, I have to say, beyond me. Um, Comrade Bin is, I believe, similarly mistaken uh, when he opined that Cliff's treatment of Lenin's seminal work, What is to be Done, was, quote, unremarkable, apart from the suggestion that Lenin may have bent some of the party rules now and then for factional purposes. That's the only thing that Bin faults Cliff for on what is to be done. But when you have a look at what is to be done, What's remarkable, in my opinion, particularly coming from someone like Cliff, who purports to be a Leninist, was the assertion that Lenin's book displayed, quote, a mechanical juxtaposition of spontaneity and consciousness, unquote, in asserting that through their own isolated experiences, workers can never develop more than trade union consciousness, which is a form, Lenin argues in the book, of bourgeois consciousness, and that as a consequence of this fact, it is necessary to struggle to bring the workers' movement under, quote, this is Lenin, under the wing of the Revolutionary Party. This, according to Cliff, Cliff cites this, and in, this is in this chapter, in this, his treatment of what is to be done, and, and he says that this shows that Lenin, quote, 
Assume that the party had answers to all the questions that spontaneous struggle might bring forth. The blindness of the embattled many is the obverse of the omniscience of the few, sneers Cliff to Lenin. Ben doesn't find that remarkable. I do, particularly from someone who's supposed to be writing a textbook of Leninism. <coughs> now, this is a Philistine attack on the Bolsheviks' conception of the relation of the conscious revolutionary vanguard to the mass of the class in itself. And in it, Cliff is expressing textbook anarcho-social democratic anti-Leninism. Cliff's organic hostility to what is to be done is hardly accidental because the whole book is a polemic against opportunists like the IS who adapt their politics to whatever illusions are currently popular. Lenin called them tailless. And the ISO is an exemplary, a perfect example of a tailless organization. When Cliff's book first appeared, Bruce Landau, himself a disaffected former ISer, published a very, uh, an incisive critique in which he identified a series of critical errors that Cliff made. The failure to grasp Lenin's analysis of economism, a misrepresentation of the reasons for launching ISCRA, a misreading of the significance of both the 1903 split and the 1905 to mass, uh, turn to mass worker recruitment, which Cliff mistakenly described as a correction by Lenin of his earlier conception of a party of professional revolutionaries. Landau's critique is on the whole a very good piece and it is well worth studying. I highly recommend it and it's available on the internet. Bruce Landau. Now another book that came out around the same time which touched on Cliff's errors somewhat more obliquely was Lenin and the Vanguard Party by Joseph Seymour, the leading intellectual of what was then a revolutionary organization, the Spartacist League, but is no more a revolutionary organization. Uh, we consider this book by Seymour to be extremely valuable, uh, an extremely valuable study of the origins and development of Bolshevism. And we have it posted to at our website, www.bolshevik.org. Among the more interesting co contributions to the discussion of Comrade Bin's critique, I thought were Lars Lee's comments on the discussions at the 1905 Congress and 1912 Prague Conference. Now, contrary to Comrade Bin's reading, the Prague Conference is generally seen as marking the point of no return for any prospect of a Bolshevik Menshevik reunification. Although, as Seymour observes in his book, quote, even before 1912, the Bolsheviks were essentially a party rather than a faction because Lenin would refuse to act as a disciplined minority under a Menshevik leadership. The Menshevik leaders, including Plekhanov, reciprocated this attitude. Unity with the numerically small pro-party Mensheviks did not challenge Lenin's leadership of the party as he reconstructed it at the Prague Conference, unquote. Um, now, Comrade Lewis and I briefly discussed the 1912 situation last night, and I was rather surprised to discover that we could agree on the following, that after 1912, each faction or party, depending how you want to label it, the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks both had their own separate underground apparatuses. They both had their own leadership. They both had their own public press, which expressed their own political lines. They each had their own treasury. The only thing they shared was a, was a name, RSDLP. Um, in, to my mind, that makes two separate groups. Um, Comrade Lewis draws different conclusions, which no doubt he'll explain, explain briefly. Finally, I want to comment on what I gather uh, Comrade Bin sees as the inevitability of bureaucratic degeneration in organizations that adopt the democratic centralist organizational structure. I think he is mistaken in this. I, think, I believe there have been groups which have operated within that framework for decades with democratic internal regimes. Not perfectly, but essentially democratic. And I would cite uh, James P. Cannon's organization the Trotskyist organization in America from the 1920s to the 1960s as a group that operated in an essentially democratic fashion, where dissidence was permitted, where dissident points of view could be heard. Um, I believe there's a consistent record of that, and I believe there are other organizations that could be cited as well. In the decade that elapsed from the launch of ISCRA to the 1912 conference, the Bolshevik faction evolved from what had been a revolutionary social democratic formation modeled essentially on the German SPD 
into an embryonic revolutionary combat party. Along the way, a few sticks were bent, some doors were slammed, voices were raised, and harsh words were exchanged. Lenin made some mistakes, and he got some things wrong. But he had a pretty good record of correcting his errors, and he probably came as close as anyone ever has to, quote, combining theory and practice to perfection, as Comrade Cliff put it in his book, a phrase that Comrade Bin objected to specifically, I might mention. The simple fact is that Lenin's party succeeded where every other attempt has failed. That was no accident, and I submit to you, we all have a great deal to learn from that experience. Okay, well, thank you for in inviting me to this debate. I think it's uh, a very, very uh, uh, crucial one for some of the reasons, actually, that Tom has, uh, has outlined in terms of learning from our past. I hope it can continue, be deepened, uh, taken to a higher level, uh, and, and long may the debate live on that level. It, it has a lot to, uh, uh, to do for us today. I want to start with a, a quote, which I think kind of neatly sums up where we are uh, with our current understanding of 1912 in particular, but uh, Bolshevism organization and, and, a, and a worldview more, more generally. Uh, and it reflects a, a, a view, I think, that is actually prevalent uh, amongst most of uh, uh, far-left uh, thought and theory uh, today. Uh, and it goes a little something like this. Uh, Prague, Party Conference, 1912. Bolsheviks constitute themselves as an independent Marxist party. Yeah. Anybody knows that, who that's from? Yep. Stalin. It's from Stalin. <laughs> it's not Stalin from 1912. I think this is very important to emphasize. Stalin in 1912, like all other leading Bolsheviks, is absolutely clear in his rejection of the accusations leveled at them that the Bolsheviks are somehow trying to set up an independent party. It's interesting that this 1938 text, the Krakti Course, I think it's called the Short Course of Party History, um, actually refers to Stalin's 1912 uh, writings on Prague, but actually the, the, the writings themselves completely contradict what he's saying. What is Stalin trying uh, uh, to do? Essentially, what Stalin is, is uh, attempting to argue is that in 1912, the Bolsheviks became a party of one faction, and ergo, no factions at all. And that's in the light of what he's trying to do in the 1930s and actually earlier, we can see what he's trying to do with this reinterpretation, this mystification of actually something that happened before, which was different. Zinoviev, uh, in 1933, uh, he writes an article which is, was unpublished and indeed unpublishable at the time, given uh, what was going on. This is three years before he's murdered by the same guy I've just quoted. Um, and he says the following, he's, right, he's, he's looking to write on Prague, and he says, I don't know why the records of the Prague conference have not yet been published. I think they've survived, and I'm pretty sure in quite detailed form. Now, the records of the Prague Party conference are dug up, I think, in the 1980s at some point by a guy, a guy called Carter Elwood, who's a historian, uh, and it's, it's, it's called The Art of Calling a Party Conference, it's a book he, uh, he wrote in a very, very good uh, um, uh, history in terms of the, the facts and getting these uh, things available, poor interpretive framework, which I'll explain. But we can now see, at least, uh, I want to set up this discussion by looking at how uh, uh, Stalin in particular and Stalinism has actually been able to, through hardly, hi in part hiding this stuff away, but reinterpret and put a particular gloss on, project back onto the history of Bolshevism, <coughs> its particular Stalinist practice. And I think we have to get up that clearly in our heads before we start to move on and think about the importance of this discussion as a way of going forward. Because on the other hand, you see, uh, Carter Elwood has this, he says the same thing as Stalin. Yeah, he says, oh well, uh, this actually proves Stalin's uh, course is, uh, is is the right interpretation. But what El Elwood, of course, does, he puts a negative sign where Stalin puts a plus sign. I.e., uh, Lenin. This shows that Lenin leads to Stalin. Lenin was a manipulator. Uh, Stalin makes the point, you know, a uh, Lenin always ha always had this plan since 1903. He didn't really tell anyone particularly, but this was his plan since 1903 to set up a one faction party. Right? And, okay, we had to do this and that with the Mensheviks. In 1912, of course, we had a Menshevik chair the conference, but that's just some way of uh, duping the Mensheviks and, uh, and confusing them and getting them on board. That's Stalin's whole, whole argument, and that's what Elwood picks up on. He calls Lenin the geometric Lenin, the calculator, the, the, the liar, the manipulator, the maneuverer. Right? And I think if Elwood and indeed Stalin are correct, 
then I, I would find it difficult to call myself a Leninist, which I do. Okay? And I think, quite rightly, Lenin would, would deserve uh, some of the, uh, the, the stuff that's been thrown his way by, uh, by bourgeois historians, uh, quite, quite clearly. Right? So wh wh why is this debate so important to now? Right? I think why it's important is because the, for those of us, like Tom and I, and, uh, both uh, together, we both call ourselves Leninists. We look back to the positive example of 1917, the victory of the Russian working class as the most advanced working class movement globally, the potentially opening up of a new epoch, etc. But I think to an overwhelming extent, we are basing our understanding, our movement is basing its understanding of Bolshevism on a Cold War caricature of what Bolshevism actually was, or a Stalinist meme. Okay? And in terms of moving forward, that is absolutely fundamental, because it, it in part explains the utter dire situation that the far left currently finds itself in today. And I'll, 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 I'll just give a few very quick examples to broadly illustrate that point. Stalinists and those who uh, are very keen on the cult of Lenin, etc., justify their monolithic party regimes on, and purges, etc., in the way uh, that Stalin, that Stalin uh, does in, in, in this. I forgot to actually give you the second part of the, the quote, which is even more revealing. Uh, is that the party strengthens itself by purging its ranks of opportunist elements. That is one of the maxims of the Bolshevik party, which is a party of a new type. You'll never find that in Lenin, by the way. A party of a new type fundamentally different from the Social Democratic Party parties of the Second International, and that will come, that's uh, where the Kautsky thing, a slight slander on Tom's part, but we'll correct that, that's fine, that's all in the good nature of, uh, of politics and, and discussion. <laughs> what, right? uh, so, so that's how Stalinists justify the way they operate, and the way they've operated in the past. That, Stalinism is a dead end, it will not get us anywhere, it cannot organise the working class seriously. Trotskyists, uh, Tom put across a, set of, a, a, a particular view there, Trotskyists use this kind of stuff to actually justify, we can only have internal opposition. Yeah, we can have factions, but they can't be public factions. They can't actually go to the public and openly say, "Here's what I'm in the same organisation as Tom. Hopefully, one day I will be." Uh, and uh, actually, Tom and I have a disagreement on the nature of the Labour Party question in America. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's absolutely healthy and a, and a fundamental feature of Bolshevist practice in its healthy form, not in its Stalinized form. That that's what happened. And I, I can cite you also examples. Anarchists. The, the, the kind of prevalence of anarchism today is premised precisely on a Cold War caricature of Lenin. That Lenin's whole thing from 1903, whether he admitted it or not, was about imposing an enlightened dictatorship on the benighted uh, uh, masses, the great unwashed. Right? Liberal and bourgeois thought I've kind of uh, touched on already in terms of Carter Elwood. So there's a lot of stake in this, uh, at stake in this debate, I think, not just but for us now, but for the future of our movement and the, the, the possibilities for us to articulate a, a viable alternative. But basing ourselves on what I would call a kind of toy town Bolshevism, right, reflects itself on, on the today's far left. We are unable to build anything. We cannot unite ourselves at the moment, let alone anybody else. And indeed, how can we? If in, in order to, uh, to pre pretend some kind of unity, we have to go to the working class and effectively on some level lie and say, actually, yeah, uh, you know, we, we do have internal differences. We've got a really internal healthy regime, by the way. Nobody, no, you, you don't know about it until you join it, of course, and then uh, when, when it invariably comes to a split, then it's all, by the way, all this happened behind the scenes, etc. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a curse on our movement. It makes us, frankly, look ridiculous. And quite clearly, the, uh, the, the more fundamental point, right, which, is, which is clear from the history of Bolshevism as well, is that the type of political organisations and regimes we struggle for now and look to embody are actually... Pre, they actually prefigure the kind of society, the understanding of working class rule that we actually see. The working class cannot rule without democracy in all spheres of life, without open polemic, without open discussion, without open thought. It cannot do it. And we see that actually in the degeneration of the Bolshevik revolution itself and how that manifests itself in the party, some of which I've alluded to uh, uh, in the 30s, but also beforehand. That's why it's not a waste of ink, as I think Paul D'Amato uh, said, maybe he didn't, but that kind of, this, this debate matters, okay? It's absolutely fundamental. And I think we on the far left have to draw, uh, uh, Tom, Tom did, did a good job of taking on Tony Cliff, I think it's a bit of an easy target, but fair enough. We on the left have to actually look and draw some of the lessons from recent historical research uh, into Bolshevism as a phenomenon. What my, I, of course I'm going to pick him up, he's a friend of mine, I work with him on several projects. Lars Lee's stuff is, is fantastic, it's rich and it actually sheds new light on what we understand by Bolshevism, what we understand by Menshevism and, uh, uh, and the party. And I have a problem with the way it's been received. I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give an example. John Mon of the British Socialist Workers Party, uh, Cliff's uh, organisation in the past, um, basically said, 
he was debating with Lars Lee at Marxism and said, this is a great book. If you're a history of Russian, stu- uh, of Russian study, uh, sorry, if you're a student of history of, of Russia, if you're a, 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 a student, now you can quote an academic to say that Lenin doesn't lead to Stalin instead of Tony Cliff, because that won't go down very well with your lecture, will it? That is literally, I mean, okay, but John Molyneux, John Molyneux wrote slightly a longer review of it, and that's to his credit. But that is the level I think we're engaged. We're applauding Lars Lee stuff, but actually not taking on the lessons of what it means for our, our movement, right? What, what, what does it do? It fundamentally starts to crack open this Cold War consensus that I've outlined in terms of Lenin studies and, Bolshevik and, uh, and, and the studies of Bolshevism. It moves beyond the cult of Lenin as some kind of uh, guy who had an organization staff full of minions and dupes, and he could basically read Hegel one day, turn around and go, everything we said is wrong, by the way, and now I'm going to win you to it. And, and uh, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, that's, that, that, again, it's caricature, it's caricature, and it's, it's, it has historical roots in the cult of Lenin. We've moved, we're starting to move beyond that. Bolshevism was a mass phenomenon, and its mass uh, uh, roots fundamentally lie and can be traced back to German social democracy in Russian conditions. You say that we want Kautsky the renegade. Kautsky the renegade uh, can, can lie and, 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 and sleep and, and, and rest in peace in that sense, right? What, re- what does renegade mean, just as a basic uh, uh, word? It means somebody who stood for something and broke with it, right? You reneged on what you said previously, French uh, word, right? Fundamentally, what Lenin Lenin never writes, and Trotsky actually as well, they never write. Look, Kautsky from the start, everything he wrote was just utter rubbish, right? And uh, the sooner we, we realise that, the better. What they say is no, Kautsky actually was the leading Marxist since Engels, right? He had a political view and a, 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 and, and a strategy which we look to emulate in Russia, and he abandoned it. He reneged on it. He became the renegade. We upheld it. Certainly, that's Lenin's point of view. So Le- Lenin, on his uh, 50th birthday, I think, this makes a speech. He's really bored because there's all these people are trying to sing happy birthday, and he's really not into that. And he just quotes, he just quotes them Kautsky from 1909. Look how well Kautsky wrote when he was a revolutionary, when he was a Marxist. All these people go, oh, you know, you imagine Tom, they go, Christ. <laughs> he's, he's actually making the fundamental point that, yes, Kautsky did have a worldview from which he broke. The other thing that, uh, that is important in terms of... Uh, 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 that mass understanding that Bolshevism as a mass phenomenon that looked to organize millions of people was that it had a robust, open, and democratic culture. Right? It was uh, fundamentally that it was committed, I agree with Tom, to a program. Membership was, was uh, uh, based on accepting the program as a whole, but you could have all sorts of differences about tactics, about particular strategic questions, and have the ability, the right, indeed the duty to articulate those, uh, those, uh, uh, those criticisms openly. And that characterizes the, the Bolshevik regime right through, I think, at least until 1918, around the Brest-Litov struggle, which, again, was an open factional struggle about uh, what to do with the Germans and the peace question. But it goes right through. I mean, you, I just got some questions. The national question, and Bukharin was, again, uh, in open factional journals and publications. Uh, voting tactics in 1906 and, indeed, 1912 and, uh, and around that. Uh, and Lenin in April 1917. Come on, comrades, get your head around it, right? Lenin comes back in April 1917 and disagrees with the party leadership. Yeah? What does he do? Does he go, oh, God, I can't speak to the masses. I can't address publicly. He, he takes it to the party leadership. Then he goes to the, uh, the Weibull committee, of the, the, the Weibull organization, a massive organization of the Bolsheviks, and there are public debates between the Bolsheviks on what to do next and the question of the second revolution. So we, we, are, it, we have thrown this away, and it's, it's, as I say, it's absolutely healthy to, to, our, to our culture. We cannot base ourselves, if we are to go forward, if we are to build anything approaching, serious, viable, party as projects of Marxism, we can't base us, our, 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 our approach on fairy tales. And not just fairy tales, but fairy tales, A, of the class enemy, and B, of Stalinism. If Stalinism was a fundamental, big, bureaucratic block to win independent working class politics in the 20th century, I think it's a, it's a block now in the 21st. We have to rebuild on a new level. We have to draw the rich lessons of Bolshevism, the positive lessons of Bolshevism that allowed them be- to become the organization that they did, that spoke in the name of so many people, and lead uh, 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 the Russian working class uh, uh, to power. We have to recognise. Uh, yeah, we have to recognise fundamentally that this notion of a party of a new type, which I say you will not find in Lenin, uh, and the so-called epistemological break that Lenin had with uh, with with uh, uh, Second International Marxism, as opposed to Kautsky breaking from the Second International Marxist orthodoxy, we have to recognise that these are things that come with the degeneration of the Bolshevik Party, either to justify what happens in the 1920s with the banning of factions, uh, as as the, the Bolshevik Party comes under extreme pressure and is trying to hold on, they're in the shit, right, and they're, they're forced to do that. We can't condemn them for that. I don't think we have to. You know, it shouldn't be our starting point today, quite clearly, right, and indeed. 
the, into the 1930s and the rewriting, the doctoring of party history to not make available fundamental documents that disprove the Stalinist lies. Now that is, you know, as a, as a Leninist, as somebody who's committed to change in this world, we have to take that on board in order to, to move forward. Just in case there's any doubts about uh, uh, the role of the Second International Marxism and how it informed the Bolshevik uh, uh, tradition and, and outlook, which was, uh, again, I, I quite admit it was added to and developed as time went on over the years, absolutely. But just in case there's any doubts about this, I again want to quote Zinoviev. And this is Zinoviev uh, quoted in uh, John Riddell's excellent book, excellent document, uh, uh, several excellent documents on the struggle for a new... Uh, uh, Lenin's revolutionary struggle, Lenin's struggle for revolutionary international, right? Great books that people should definitely get hold of it. This is Zinoviev discussing uh, 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 the, the basis of what they're trying to do now that the Second International has collapsed, has gone along with the, uh, um, uh, the Kaiser state effectively by supporting the First World War. What does Zinoviev say? He does not uh, as is often claimed, say, well, yes, uh, here we go, then that shows that we were wrong on everything hitherto, and uh, look what's happened. Our, stra our whole strategy was wrong because look what's happened in Germany. What he says is, is the following, and I'll, I'll end with this, if I may. We are not, that's emphasised, we are not renouncing the entire history of the Second International. We are not renouncing what was Marxist in it. In the last years of the Second International's existence, the opportunists and the centre obtained a majority over the Marxists. But, in spite of everything, a revolutionary Marxist tendency always existed in the Second International. And we are not renouncing its legacy for one minute. Right? And again, that just shows really what uh, uh, the, 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 the importance underlines the fact that this, this break, this, this, uh, this, this uh, attempt to drive a wedge between the experience of the Second and Third International does come, come later on. I think we have to, it's not that the Second International had all the answers, it, it failed, right? But there was, a, there was Second International revolutionary Marxism, and I think that has a lot of rich lessons for us today, uh, not to copy, not to emulate, but actually to learn from and assimilate about how to build mass Marxist organisations. Because if we can't do that, we are failing. We are failing fundamentally in, in our task to articulate some kind of alternative in the face of despair, economic crisis, and, uh, and general downturn. I think that would be irresponsible of us not to, uh, to, to, be, to be aloof to some of the theoretical insights and historical uh, things that we've learned recently and are continuing to build on. It would be absolutely criminally irresponsible, actually, and I think that's what we have to do in order to shift this debate forward and actually give it practical political content. Thank you very much. I wanted to um, pose a couple of questions to you guys based on your opening remarks. Um, first would be, uh, and I'll say both of them at once, um, first would be uh, just a point of clarification with Tom, um, that uh, it sounds like, Tom, you're characterizing um, Tom Bin's criticism of Cliff as coming um, significantly, if not largely or mostly, from the right, in other words, that, that all the problems with, with Cliff, um, that it does sound like um, you're, you're characterizing Ben's critique of Cliff as coming from the right, as being in some ways worse even uh, than, than Cliff's perspective, on the one hand. Um, and uh, with respect to democratic centralism um, and the SWP US as a model, I was wondering whether you could get into um, some sort of concrete examples um, of you know, what is a, a kind of a later history than what we've been talking about so far, namely the history of Bolshevism prior to 1917. Um, in terms of you know, a healthy uh, Marxist party with democratic centralism. Now for Ben, um, I wanted uh, you to address, um, and this relates to uh, the substance of what Tom was raising, um, the difference between splits and purges. Right. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between splitting and purging? Um, and uh, how we might think about the history of such splits in, in the history of Marxism um, in terms of transformation, because I think that some of your uh, discussion had to do with um, uh, problematizing characterizations of breaks. Right. In other words, that you know these these transformations have been characterized as breaks, 
whereas really uh, it sounds like you want to emphasize continuity um, and that we might think about transformation versus breaks. I think that bears upon the question of purging and splitting. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are the questions I wanted to put back on you guys. And then uh, feel free also, before we open up to Q&A from the, from the floor, um, also to maybe respond to each other's opening remarks. Well, I uh, don't know Comrade Bin, never met him. Um, I think there's a, a whiff of anti-Leninism in his critique. Um, I expected that in the course of the discussion today, I expected he would be here, uh, that some of that would come out more clearly, or you know, he might uh, correct the formulation here or there. So I was uh, suggesting that, in fact, he's wrong. I think he's Frankly, my guess, without ever having met the comet, only having read a couple of things he's written, I just think he's, um, I think he's perhaps being taken a little too seriously. Um, I don't think his criticism of Cliff is very substantial. I tried to kind of suggest that when he, as his evidence that 1903 is not a significant event, the break between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks is not a significant event, and he says Lenin says it isn't a significant event, or doesn't mention it rather. And this, the very thing he cites is the proof that it's not important where Lenin doesn't mention. In fact, Lenin does mention and says it prepares the whole basis for the success of the revolution. That's, 19, that's left in communism, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You know, now, <clears throat> I have to say also that if he'd written a critique of our, something we'd written, and we were writing a defense of it, we might possibly have picked that up and responded. It's an example of how sloppy and how weak ideologically this debate is that people who have obviously have capacity, D'Amato's thing was quite well written, you know, he made a lot of good points, it sort of made sense. Uh, Paul LeBlanc has done useful stuff, um, you know, is a well, fairly thoughtful response. But the only thing they can think to say back to Ben is, well, you know, Lenin can't mention everything in every work. Like, you know, he didn't even bother to look and see. Uh, but to have, to have cited it in the first place, it either means that Comrade Bin, perhaps, I don't know, I don't know the Comrade, maybe he has trouble reading. But if he does have trouble reading, well, I mean, that's a possibility, right? He should, he may not even be aware that he has trouble reading. Then he should go back and look at a book. But as a rule, it's not a good idea to cite something as a proof which says the opposite of what you claim it's going to say. And it's a kind of low level of a discussion that we have to start this discussion. So you say the comrade has, do you think the comrade is somewhat to the right of Cliff? Well, if Cliff says 1903, the initial break with the Mensheviks is an important thing and lays the basis in some way, and Cliff probably screws it up a bit here and there because, you know, he's a bit sloppy himself. But he, yeah, he's right against Ben. If Ben says it's not important, I mean, you know, it, it's just, it's not so much right and left, it's just, Uninformed, let's say, to use a polite word. Uh, just to clarify, it sounded like you were accusing um, Finn of having more of an opportunist, maybe. Uh, it's hard for me to know. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, well, I think certainly Ben's project of the whole left should get together and all join Occupy, form one giant party, is even puts him a little bit to the right of Comrade Lewis here, who <laughs> doesn't want everybody in this thing. And, uh, you know, when, when D'Amato, <laughs> D'Amato, D'Amato's response to this is he says, if you put, if you put uh, Stalinists and Social Democrats and people who want to vote for the Democratic Party and people who never want to vote for the Democratic Party, if you put them all in the same group, you're not going to have a very effective operational group. That's an obvious point. And Bin comes back and, you know, has some negative comment on that. I just, I, I just think the comrade lacks experience. This is, you know, anybody who's been in a serious left group, when you're out on the campus or you're at the factory or whatever, the, the nine times out of ten, the first suggestion you get from people is, oh, you, all you small groups, you guys should all get together. Why aren't you all together? Well, Comrade Lewis thinks that's a good criticism, but we think there's a good reason why people aren't together. You know, there's a reason why Bob Avakian has not fused with platypus and et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, now as for the SWP and its history, 
just, you know, if you study, you've got to look at the history. You've got to investigate these things. I think it's good what Lars Lee is doing. Uh, I haven't, I have to say, I haven't really read it. Um, uh, yeah, I've read some little bits of it and stuff. But, you know, I, I, any investigation is good. And it's quite possible that Carter Elwood has written a good book. Uh, his recommendation I was unaware of, and I appreciate you bringing that up, and drawn the wrong conclusions. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of even bourgeois historiography about uh, Leopold Hameson wrote a book in 1955. It was more or less commissioned by the American government so they could figure out what the hell Bolshevism was, so how better to combat it. It's an excellent book. He's, he just describes what he, of course, concluded that 1903 did have a certain significance. Um, <laughs> Funny. <just> the, <laughs> anyway, um, I would like to hear, uh, so in terms of the SWP's history, they, there's a suggestion, there's a French turn. So, you know, Cannon has fused with Musty, and they're going to make the turn into the SP. And Oler, Hugo Oler, who is a very talented mass worker and a very important Canaanite cadre, one of their leading proletarian, probably their leading working class organizer, says, no fucking way. Lenin broke with the Second International for very good reason. We're not, they killed Luxembourg, et cetera, We're not going to rejoin. Doesn't. They have a big, long faction, and if you got, if you read the SWP internal bulletins, in fact, go look at the SWP internal bulletins. They're about this long for that period. It was not a very big group. People wrote stuff. It got printed, and you could say whatever you wanted. He took out 200 people, or something like that. He took about a third or at least a quarter of the group. That's significant. They lost a lot of people, but they had it out politically, and, you know, they didn't go to people's houses with guns, and they didn't you know, say that he was a sexual manipulator and they didn't do all this crap and garbage. They just had an argument over whether or not it's a good idea to join the SP at this time. You get the same thing with a Shackman split. Nobody's, you know, nobody gets beat up. There's no guns being pulled on people. There's no Shackman is being employed by the Mikado. None of that crap. It's just, is the Soviet Union a degenerated worker state that needs to be defended or is it not? That's the dispute. The same thing with Goldman Morrow in 1946. The same thing with Cochrane Clark. Again, they lose the proletarian. They lose about another quarter of the group. They lose in 1953. But you can read those polemics back and forth. You can read everything it said. Um, it's you know, and and you can talk to the people who went through that experience. Uh, people don't like Cannon. He used techniques. Blah blah blah. He banged the door. But it's. You know, that is within the realm of, and Lenin also was famous for door slamming, and Lenin was not uh, going to have his hands tied by the Mensheviks telling him what he could do and what he couldn't do. I would, I would say that um, the phrase, uh, well, let me, let me just touch on a couple of things that Comrade Lewis raised. Um, this, this business about the party of the new type, the party that Lenin organized was different than the model of the Second International. The model of the Second International, the conception was it's the heart party of the whole class. And those elements of the working class, which were not socialist revolutionary in the view of the Second International, were holdovers. They were leftovers. They were petty bourgeois fragments. They were guildists. They were people who hadn't really been fully incorporated into the working class. That's not true of the Leninist party. Lenin's party is, Lenin's organizational conception at, in its maturity is premised on the basis that there is a section of the class which is, is corrupted by imperialism and welded to the interests of the, uh, of the imperialists. It's the labor aristocracy and it's the, uh, you know, the agency of the capitalists within the workers' movement. You don't want those people in the party. You want the revolutionary elements, the revolutionary vanguard, and you want the vanguard to extend its influence over as many workers as possible. But you don't want opportunists. You don't want social chauvinists. You don't want social imperialists in the vanguard. That is a party of a new type. That is not a party of the whole class, first. Secondly, the common turn which is the international organization that's set up, that comes out of, this, uh, the, out of the success of the Bolshevik Revolution, to organize, to split the Second International and build revolutionary organizations all over the world, head an organizational model, which is the organizational model I describe, not the organizational model Comrade Lewis describes. And that is because that is Bolshevik practice, as they felt the best way for American communists to organize themselves was not to put all their differences out in the public so they could be made ridiculed by the Chicago Tribune, Fox News, and any other backward elements in the working class, but rather so that they could dispute questions of revolutionary theory. Revolutionaries could hammer out between themselves. And so I wouldn't be afraid to say that Comrade Lewis is a 
you know, mistaken of this and that, a revisionist, whatever, because I don't want to appear on Fox News saying that, because next week he and I have to go out campaign jointly for the candidate of Bob Avakian to take the congressional seat in Illinois. <laughs> Now, Comrade Lewis is insisting that we have to support the Avakianites, and I'm saying, no, I don't want to. Do, am I insisting? But, yes, Avakian you are. You are. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, in my hypothetical <laughs> model. Okay, exactly. in your but, but it's going to look bad when we're on TV together and Fox News is intercutting these things. You know, I mean, it's just it's a matter of practical politics that this model is developed. The Bolshevik experience and the Bolsheviks export it to places like Australia and Thailand and Peru, et cetera, and they export the same model. They export this thing about revolutionary talk to revolutionaries, hammer out the policy, and, if, and then we jointly implement it, and I become convinced that Comrade Lewis is right. It was correct tactic, because now we split the Avakianites, they're half as big and we're twice as big. You know, or, or he's convinced the other way, and we change the policy. Sure. Okay, uh, so uh, finally, 1912. Um, 1912, you got two organizations, you got two leaderships, you got two underground networks, two papers, two lines, everything. That is, in effect, the point of no return for the RSDLP. Now, what goes on is, Lenin makes an offer. He contacts every underground organization in Russia and invites them all to come to the conference. And there were some Mensheviks, but the underground organizations, but mostly the Mensheviks were doing legal above-ground work. They weren't invited. Lenin called them the liquidators. This was a conference for non-liquidators. Now. So there were Mensheviks, and some of them came. Lenin said, great. This was, this was Lenin's attempt to reach out to the healthy elements of the Mensheviks and separate them from their leadership. The guys who were actually running the risks and doing the stuff in the underground, Lenin thought should be in our party. And, and, you know, if they had a few deviationist ideas, we could kind of work that out. Lenin was quite happy to have a minority of, of people who didn't necessarily agree on everything, um, but he didn't want to be in an organization which was run by people who want to have unity with the capitalists. And that's 1912. It was a tactic. Okay. Uh, I think I'll start with the, the party. I mean, again, a lot of this stuff is just straw men. I mean, I did, I, I apologize for heckling the terms, but it's, it's quite frustrating. Uh, the party of the, the whole class. The SPD was not a party of the whole class. That's Seymourism. That's just a, a standard uh, Lenin and the Vanguard party misconception. What, what did the SPD do? It didn't include syndicalists. It did not, it actually, the, the, the Second International was founded on the basis that the anarchists are not in, right? That, that, that's not the whole class, right? It actually, uh, at several points during uh, the debates, uh, debated, and indeed threw out, yeah, of its ranks, people who broke the uh, programmatic uh, uh, outlines that the Second International adopted. Millerand. Millerand, in 1898, becomes part of a French capitalist government. He's expelled. Right? He has gone, it's not, oh, Milleron, he's a nice guy, like Bob Avakian, because he talks about the workers, let's have him in, we'll have a love in. No, right? That is just, it's, it's, it's a straw man, it, it, it's, it's not an argument. Because, uh, and you can look at in, in the 1890s, the, the debates with the German right, Kautsky puts forward uh, 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 motions to expel people like Vollmer, right? It's not just everybody in the party, the whole class, get everyone together, wonderful. It's the program. It's the acceptance of the program and its, its strategic vision. It's not based on, do you agree with the first four congresses of the Comintern, the Soviet Union is a General Worker State, that the canon was right against Schachmann. It's a program in the here and now, right? It's a political programmatic commitment. That's what Lenin took. The RSDLP, you can read it in 1903, you should definitely read Lars Lee's book. The, 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 the RSDLP is based on you accept the program as a whole. You're fully within your rights to disagree with aspects of it, but you accept it and you will fight for it, right? And you will die for it, quite frankly. It's not, oh, let's get party of the whole class. It's just. It, it, it's frustrating that we're at that kind of level of discussion. It's, 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 it's completely irrelevant to where we're, we're, we are at. Comment in the organization model, this is very, it becomes very interesting. I actually agree with a lot of the stuff you said, because left-wing communism, I think, again, I don't want to go too long into this, because it, it opens up another vista in the discussion. I think that the generation of the, of the self-conception of Bolshevik organization does set in earlier, and Lenin does bear some responsibility for it. I think left-wing communism is the first time, actually, seriously, it's, it's, the, it's the first time, and you, you, if you point out, it's the first time where, where Lenin says, in, in 1903, there was significance about the, uh, the Bolshevik and Metric split. Plan Bean is actually right. And in none of his writings up until, uh, uh, um, uh, up until that point does Lenin actually talk about the Bolshevik party. Or the only references in his collected works about the Bolshevik party are actually inserted by the editors afterwards in footnotes. 
Right? I think we have to get our heads on that. But I do think, in 1920, the Bolsheviks, under the pressure of, of the civil war and what's happened, uh, they do actually have to change their organizational model, which they did export. I've done a book on uh, uh, German social democracy and the 21 conditions. Right? The 21 conditions were basically purge yourselves of the, uh, of the, of the opportunists and the reformists uh, and, and organize on that basis. I defend those conditions under those conditions. Right? under the circumstances they were faced. The problem we've got is that's been generalised as a political method in order to combat opportunism and right-wing ideas. And that's not going to get us anywhere. Otherwise, you can split, you've got a one person. You, you technically split with yourself, although it's difficult. Right? But th that's essentially what we have to have. What, 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 the, what the Bolsheviks did and, what, and what, what the SPD didn't do, and that's why it is a different organisation, that's where Kautsky failed, was that they did not openly attack the right. Right? Quite clearly, if you look at the mass strike discussion, uh, they were caught, the German uh, centre, the German Marxist Orthodox wing, were not willing to go and say, actually, Legion and the people we're in deals with, they are bastards and they're going to sell you out. Whereas actually the Bolsheviks, they didn't insist on organisational separation, at least not until later on. Yeah? What they did was have a head on ideological uh, warfare, which you quoted. But that's factional. You, you, it, the fact that there's Mensheviks and there's Bolsheviks with separate press, separate organisation, that's factions. Right? The party we, in, we, we should be aiming for. We'll bring together factions, not but let's get together with Bob Avakian. It's on a, a higher fundamental political level, but it will have, yes, the IBT. We've, we've said to you on several occasions in Britain, you should join us and be a faction and have the rights to change the leadership of the organisation, change the politics of the organisation. Otherwise, we are failing. We are miserably putting up with a stupid situation which is based on we are the pure and uh, until we, uh, we, we, can, we must only continue as, a, as an organisation and then we'll, the, the revolution will come and we will win. It's nonsense. Right? That's, uh, that's the fundamental lesson that I think we need to draw. Factions are healthy. They were an absolutely healthy part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the RSDLP, and open political struggle was part of it. That's why you did have uh, separate leadership, separate finances. They were factions. Just on purges, uh, purges and, and splits, as I say, 1920 uh, is, a, is an absolutely justified split. I mean, uh, again, I've written about that. You can read my book. I've sold out, but it's online. Um, you, you, can, you can get it there. Um, but, but the, as I say, there's a logic, and there's a, you know, I, I know some people here are quite keen on Adorno, so I'll, I'll throw in Adorno. It's, <laughs> there is sometimes like a, you know, a negative dialectic in splits, in the sense that both sides kind of come off worse. I don't know if I'm currently working with Adorno well enough here, but <laughs> both sides can actually come off worse. And I think that's, uh, that's where we've kind of got with, with, with this kind of, kind of stuff. So it's, it's, there's, there's a difference between transformation uh, 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 and, and, and breaks. What I'm trying to stress with continuity is not that the Bolsheviks just did the same thing that they said in 1903. They actually added to their, to their strategy. They took on board what had happened. But they did have a fundamental strategy, which was the merger of socialism and the workers' movement, the minimum maximum program, democratic revolution, to the end, mass or party organisation at all levels of society. That is ABC Second International Marxism. I'm sorry. That's what took the Russian working class to power in 1917. We cannot have any argument of that. That's not even hidden away in some obscure Stalinist uh, uh, Russian text. That's in Lenin CW about the debates with Buk uh, Bukharin and the Maximalists over the nature of the programme in 1917, 1918. Look it up. Right? They don't say, oh by the way, that was great, we just had a transitional programme. Well hey, they're actually saying but Bukharin is actually putting forward, let's get rid of the minimum programme because we're in power. And says, don't be stupid. We need the minimum program because we might lose power. These are all, these, these are the, look it up in CW, it's 1917 and 1918. Um, Let me um, sorry. <coughs> wrap up quick so we can... Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, da, 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 da. I think, yeah, just, just on the Leopold Hamas, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not I, I agree with you, by the way. This, this Bertrand Wolf's uh, uh, three made a revolution, again, it's kind of like a cold... Yeah, exactly. These, these, these are serious historians, right? Uh, and they do dig up uh, really good stuff, which we can use. The problem I have is, as, I, as I've kind of... Uh, his, largely makes the point that when it comes to Lenin, all historiographical standards do not apply. <laughs> so Elwood can read this stuff, and what, what Elwood's about is actually he has to say, well, Lenin's a bit of a devious bastard, and, uh, and he has to give the whole spiel about why this was actually not a serious attempt to unite pro-party Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, but some kind of schema to... Uh, well, it to was. It was to but, but exactly, and, and you agree with that. And, yeah. and, and that says Lenin is a manoeuvrer and a liar and dishonest. And, no, uh, yes. Yeah. And so, so what, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm actually saying is that, yeah, there, there, are, rich, there are rich treasures in, in, in Cold War historiography, uh, uh, even though they're written by the, the, what's it, the Hoover Institute and that kind of stuff, uh, as part of, you know, smashing, uh, uh, intervening in the Cold War. But we, can't, we need to glean uh, from it and actually put across our own perspective and not some uh, uh, kind of watered-down or anti-working class perspective. That's the point. But I th I'm sure we agree on that, you know. Let me open it up. Um, you in the back. Red shirt. Oh, I might, might correct and summarize what you said. That while the radical left is an expert to put on the Visionary programs, bold tactics of splitting, refining, and forging the revolutionary leadership. That, in fact, they're leading no one nowhere. And that one of the reasons for this is that a 
let's say even those more orthodox defenders against Stalin have in fact adopted a rigid statement about what Leninism and what Lenin did was Broadly, broadly speaking, yes. I think, I think even the, the, the most formally anti-Stalinist currents have slept walked into Stalinoid forms of organization. And would you say that, that, that Fox, what were his failings in history? Perhaps he's starting to challenge us because looking at the dynamism of Occupy, which no left group can conceive of, much less organized, this spontaneous movement, the spontaneous populist movement, did so without reference to any of the groups that worked for decades at forging the revolutionary leadership that we know and know. And that there's a problem at this junction between those two. And how do we how do we bring that together, whatever his his face is. And you seem to be saying that first we need to stop, we need to stop this notion that in order to unite, before we unite, we must demarcate, that we're in fact just demarcating. Demarcating. Until the last person expels himself. Okay. Which may be in the idea. I don't know. <laughs> But, but is that, is that, am I fair? Is that broadly speaking, I mean, I can come back, but yeah, broadly, broadly speaking, I mean, uh, it, it, it's incumbent upon the left at the moment to get its act together and unite on a serious basis, not on a Stalinist, not on a Vakian basis, not on a, a silly basis, but with, with a vision that we can take to Occupy, take to uh, the working class movement more generally, that is viable. Because pe when, you, you know, you, when you go to people and say, I'm a Marxist, I'm in this group, they say, well, what, about, what about that group? What about that group? Why, why didn't you idiots get together? There's a truth in that. There is a truth in that, and it's not, to, it's not to say let's all just get together. It's actually a fundamentally essential question, and that's what Lenin did. We have to look back at the, the history. That's the significance of what is to be done. That's the significance of Iskra. He built a party out of the wreckage of all these different local groups with sometimes crazy ideas and all the rest of it, and forged them on a higher level. That's our task. Occupy might come and go, but our task is to uh, intervene. Um, my question kind of relates to that, because I'm trying to kind of so like the kind of like deeper history you guys like bring into play. I mean it's like obviously you guys have done like serious like scholarly work on those topics. But um, um, you, you you kind of talked about this in in, in your talk and um, this kind of like 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 hidden legacy of topics and then how this is like inhibiting um, something like or like like motivate even feel like coming back and like um, something like you know like anarchism today. And so my, my question would be just to, to maybe help me to kind of make sense of like the kind of deeper like historical disputes you guys have on like certain historical issues. Like in, in, in what way does that like connect to like the present day? Because it like it also like kind of seems to me that like you know that 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 whereas like uh, in the previous period that you guys dispute, you kind of had like a broad like workers movement and like. Um, something that like actually like something like leadership of an organization like made made sense and like it kind of emerged like in in that time period right I mean something that I don't know like maybe like Korsh draws out right that, like how like 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 Marxism is, it, itself is a phenomenon of like of of, of the emergence of the proletariat and 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 so 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 today I mean we do have none of that and so in 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 in, in what relationship does like something like like an organized Marxist party stand to that and you know like how how can actually those disputes you guys have actually have a bearing on the present? Uh, both of you guys please. Do you want to go Tom, Tom or should I go first? Uh, well I, I think that uh, there are, there is it's quite possible if you're serious about wanting to um, be able to see a left which is able to wield um, significant influence and actually able to combat the austerity programs. I mean, the, what we're looking at is a world in which the capitalists are feeling um, that they really don't have too much to worry about coming from beneath. They also don't have too much to worry about with the Soviet Union being gone. That was a significant counterweight. Their their hands are, are free, untied. and. We, what we need to do is, uh, at least we need to be able to think our way through how we got into the situation we're in right now. I think that Stalinism is an enormous part of that. Um, an aspect of Stalinism, of course, was Maoism. Uh, there, you know, several generations, I went to Mike Eli's thing today, and one of the things he said was, um, we should be in a different place than we are now, he said, speaking as someone as my vintage. And I, I felt I knew what he meant, you know. Forty years ago, uh, we had demonstrations of up to a million people that I was on against the war in Vietnam. And this was ongoing kinds of things. Um, 
thousands, tens of thousands of, of young leftists went into factories to get in touch with workers, or probably a total of maybe 10,000 in, in the United States and North America, so that they could go and proselytize in stupid sorts of ways and didn't have a big impact. But, you know, there was a real... Uh, an attempt to carry things out, the, and and they even worked their way far enough to figure that it had to. We had to. The new left, of course, didn't begin at this. It began as, as oh, to hell with all this bullshit. It, a lot of what we hear from Occupy, is there was a guy on the Occupy panel here yesterday. He said, you know, I was I've been a socialist since I was seven. Uh, I I went and uh, every day I would go and you know he's still pretty young. He's in his early twenties, I guess. But he often at high school and whatever, he'd be telling people, you know, capitalism is no good. The answer is socialism. The answer is socialism. Nobody would listen to him. He had no impact. Nobody paid any attention. Now he's an Occupy. The trick is don't actually put out any ideas. Just say, <laughs> we've got to Occupy. And people say, yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know? And of course, it's, that's true. And, you know, but part of why that is, of course, is because it's a blank slate. You can write anything you want onto it. And the New Left began that way. They began by saying, you know what? Ah, look at this, the Communist Party, a reformist crawling around for the Democrats, the, the so-called Trotskyists who are having peace crawls and saying, you know, peaceful legal and, you know, having constitutional amendments and all kinds of crap. We want none of that. We want to have something totally different. We're also going to have acid and we're going to have free sex and we're going to have all this other stuff that these guys, these suit and tie socialists don't go for. It's a really big, groovy party we're having. Plus, we're going to have a revolution on top of it. And I actually, <laughs> I, I believed that. And, you know, I organized my life in such a way as to participate in that as best I could. And, <laughs> I, I certainly wasn't the only one, I can tell you. Um, but after a while, and in many attempts and, and uh, false starts, we collectively worked our way back around to realizing that actually we needed to take seriously this thing about organizing. We needed to have organized. We needed probably eventually, some of, many of us came to the conclusion reluctantly that we had to become Leninists again and that we had to go to the working class. These people we'd sneered at as, you know, all they care about is new toasters and color TVs and crap. We're going to, you know, we're going to be like the Vietnamese and to sleep on with no mattresses on the floor and only eat brown rice and stuff. No, actually, we realized, no, we're never going to get anywhere until we can connect with the ordinary people who actually do this stuff and actually make and run this society and are the potential ruling class. Without them, nothing's possible. So we had to make contact with them. All of this, so that's a huge accomplishment and there were still probably you know 30 40,000 people who were participating in this and we're all very young very energetic but because you know of the configuration of world politics at that point it appeared uh, that Mao was our leader we read Mao told us things of fight US imperialism resolutely smash revisionism yeah smash revisionism fight resolutely so everybody tried to carry out Mao's dictums of United Front Against Imperialism. That's how the Avakianites started. The United Front Against Imperialism, which means find the progressive element of the U.S. ruling class to unite with against the imperialist element, and the endless confusion and stupidities, and China's line is our line, and eventually China said, you know what, if you're truly loyal, truly loyal, oh, well, we're truly loyal, you will dissolve your organizations and you will renounce communism because they didn't want an international Maoist. So most of the Maoist groups went out of business shortly thereafter. The Avakianites, to their credit, did not. Um, so so what, what does that tell us? What that tells us is that there was a large opportunity, potentially, in the 60s and early 70s. It was squandered because people didn't actually work out you know, the experience that had preceded them. I think that we're in a similar situation now. Occupy is more primitive in many ways, but more sophisticated in some ways than the New Left was. Uh, I, I don't think it's likely, I mean, I certainly hope that we that Occupy continues to ferment and uh, do some exciting things, particularly on the West Coast. I think it's actually there's been an intersection with working class, which our organization has attempted as best we can through what influence we have to participate in through the Longshore Union. And the interaction of Longshore and Occupy has produced some situations that have had some potential and, and you know, had some impact. I think a lot of things are possible, but I don't think anything's possible until people 
the serious people who are going to be the revolutionary kernel within this formation get some things sorted out. And I don't think that means everybody has to come and join our group. What we think is that people will work out for themselves and need to, through political struggle, work out what the answers are and look and see what the traditions are. But I do think we need to form a Leninist group where revolutionaries talk to revolutionaries, work out a common program without subjecting themselves to the pressure of bourgeois public opinion. I do think that, you know, that it has to be based on the teachings of Lenin, which I do think were continued by Trotsky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that lots of things are possible, but that without understanding the past, we will not conquer the future. Ben. Yeah, I, I mean, I... The, the start with we finished off in that sense I mean I made the point yesterday about uh, the historical situation we currently find ourselves in and we certainly still do uh, live in the shadow the negative legacy of what went before I mean that's quite clear and uh, and in that sense you know it's interesting hearing you about yes you thought this was it and uh, but no I mean it, it wasn't that we had we didn't have enough big demonstrations give out enough leaflets people didn't devote their lives on that level to you know sleeping on whatever you were sleeping on and eating brown rice uh, but, you know, but and, and millions across the world. The problem is, it was, our, our politics were wrong at a much, much deeper, deeper level. And I think, uh, e I say, even the most anti-Stalinists of comrades have actually come to realise uh, it pertains to this crisis of leadership thing. I think it goes much, much deeper than that. Right? So my starting point in that sense is yes, history. We have to, we have to look back to, uh, 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 to, to look at what we built in order to rebuild. And that really pertains to your question about um, what does the, the, a partyist project. A bit, what relationship does it have to actually in the here and now occupy and, uh, and uh, what you're saying, uh, yeah, to society more generally in this very difficult period? And I think that the answer is, is on one level very simple, on the other level slightly more complex. The, the, the simple level is that we need to rebuild the working class movement at more or less from scratch. Right? More or less from scratch. We can do that. We can, do, we can have a serious intervention uh, in, in, in class politics internationally with some sort of basic political unity. We're not going to be able to do it on the basis of our current fragmentation into 57 varieties of uh, competing idiocy, quite frankly. Right? We need to actually, and, and we see that from the, the, the history, the positive impact that unity has had on the working class movement at base. 1920, the formation of the Communist Party of Great Britain, a very small organization in relation to uh, 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 France, uh, Germany, Italy, had a massive impact. On, on class organisation and the trade union struggle and rebuilding at base. 1875 in, uh, in, in Germany, they actually went out and built the trade unions right, from the, 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 the organisation that, that was formed. So I think that's, that's the basic point. We need to re rebuild on a new political basis which draws the best from the past and not the shadows and, and, uh, and organisational uh, Stalinoid forms we've walked into. Right? We need to rebuild on a new basis. We need to educate again. We need mass, you know, the level of Marxist education generally across the board at the moment is very, very low because it's not taken seriously. People, are, people in left-wing groups are treated as people, to, as, can, as cannon fodder, well, kind of cannon fodder, leaflet fodder uh, to go as... <laughs> uh, so, you know, they're, they're not taught to actually think and, and take seriously Marxist theory to articulate their difference, etc. I think we... We do need a, a cultural revolution on the left, and with that, with with that, uh, um, to, to use a Maoist phrase, <laughs> to, 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 but, but with that, then you can actually seriously uh, think about doing the, uh, at least coming to terms with some of the enormous challenges that come our way. As I say, we need to more or less start from scratch, all right, uh, uh, and that does mean. Uh, uh, so I, I think just on Occupy, for example, what Occupy in Britain is just a, it, it's it's. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke, essentially, right? But what I think is good in America, from the reports I've heard, at least, anyway, is precisely the West Coast stuff, the, point, the, the fact that the working class, the labor movement, weak as it is and uh, fragmented as it is in this country, is drawing links. That, for me, shows uh, potential. I'm not, I'm not under the illusion that Occupy is going to form the new uh, political organization. I just don't think that's going to happen, and maybe I do disagree with um, uh, being on that point. But that's certainly a, 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 healthy, a healthy thing from, from this point, uh, point of view. And, and that's essentially the, the, the overall writing task of our epoch. It's, not, it's perhaps not the most inspiring, per se. It's perhaps not the most, if you, if you jo only jo you join us today, then we'll promise you the, the, the great life tomorrow. It's a long-term view. We need that. We can't just chase the next demonstration, chase the next action. We actually have to say, where are we historically? What does that mean, and how do we go forward? And I, I hope that, certainly with the... Um, 
uh, some of the, the research I've done, but basically I'm not a, a scholar of Russian history. I, I draw a lot on Lars Lee. Uh, I'm German stuff as me. But, um, but you know, certainly we, we can look at this stuff and, and glean some of the best stuff, for it, stuff from it in order to move forward. I think that's the point. And it can have a direct impact in the here and now. Richard, uh, first of all, Ben, I want to say how delighted I was that you prepared all the papers in the world. I never thought I'd be <laughs> I'm sure you'll be, you'll be pleased. <laughs> um, but I want to say two, two questions. I want to address each of you. Uh, so, Tom, I, I also follow the, the Seymour School, which I think is basically consistent with most serious bourgeois historiography, but that's because I've been brainwashed by Trotskyism and bourgeoisie, I don't know. But one of the passages that I actually found interesting in that document is that Seymour raises the question, why Marxists from the 1860s to 1900s didn't try to form parties of the Leninist type. And he gives a somewhat economist response. And I wonder what you think is an answer to that. And that sort of brings up the question of what changed circumstances uh, meant for Lenin's formulation of what I think is correctly seen as a party of a new type. And also whether, in fact, Lenin's position from 1903 to 1914 or 1917 really doesn't represent sort of an intermediate step because he didn't fully break. I mean, the left wing of the Second International didn't break from the Second International. And the question is, should they have done so before the crisis of 1940? So that's one question I have to you. And I guess the, the basic question I have to you, Ben, is that, and I think about this because obviously I think the CPG as a project has much more in common with Platypus, obviously, than the IDP. Although, well, I, I think you disagree, but okay. Yep. I mean, yep, I, sure. I, think, I, think, I think in some ways there, there are greater similarities, although there may be certain ideological similarities with part of us in the IBT. But Platypus is obviously not trying to form a political party. And one of the things, you know, I'm sure the CPGB is bigger than the IBT, but it's not significant. Bigger. And so the question is, it seems to me somewhat of an illusion, and I... I do think that despite what you say, that the vision you have of a party is a neo kapskian position. And it seems to me an illusion that under present political circumstances, that a neo kapskian approach to party building is actually going to build mass parties. Like what I think that the broader political conception would only probably build bigger but still minuscule so, political sects. And so the question is, isn't it better if you're going to have a series of minuscule political sects, isn't it better to have a minuscule or even microscopic political sect like the IBT that has a clear political line rather than one like the CPGB that has a fuzzier and more confused one? <laughs> well, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> Now, what was the other question? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, 1860s to 1900. I mean, th that's an interesting thing to speculate about. There are a couple of things that I would say just off the top, and I, I know I went on too long, less than, so I'll try to be brief. One is that there was a lot of experience that, that had to be achieved before certain things that we kind of take for granted. You know, there's always a tendency to think of our, you know, to look back on people and think, oh, why didn't they realize that? You know, the world was round, everybody knew that, but at the time it was sort of a novel idea. Um, you know, I mean, there was, for instance, the experience of the Paris Commune, which was enormous and changed Marx's view of, um, you know, what, how socialist revolution was going to take place, and also kind of probably maybe made it clear that there was real potential in a fairly immediate prospect had things been done right. And on the other hand, everything was done wrong. I mean, if there's ever an argument for a uh, organization that had some idea of what they were doing, it's the Paris Commune, which had really no Marxist participating in it. It was a melange of left liberals and radical greens and everything else. Um, and it didn't, it didn't um, well, I'm saying, you know, I mean, the equivalents. There'd be a, a you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Proudhon. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, sort of fooling around a bit. But, but that, so that, that kind of thing is important, and that shapes the subsequent decades. And uh, uh, there's also the development of capitalism itself. I mean, 1860, we don't have imperialism in the sense there's the British Empire and the colonies and stuff, but, but capitalist development takes place that puts, um, you know, that in, I think in some ways is intersected by the, uh, 
the Leninist organizational form in ways that might not have been applicable earlier. I mean, on the other hand, well, in any case, um, the uh, well, what I, about, like, I, Engels I, role? I mean, Engels didn't like offer. I mean, in well, the, the second international, of course, there's the first international Marx participates in. And the lesson there is you can't get everybody, and the CPGB goes that far. Um, just on, on your previous reply, I recognize the second international didn't take absolutely everybody. But when we say, when Seymour says the party of the whole class, I don't believe it was something Seymour invented either, but it, the conception was that the working class should should have a party. There be a workers' party and include the whole class. That's not Lenin's conception. Lenin's conception is that there's a there's a section of the working class which is bought off, corrupted, and that the party should not attempt to include the whole class. Uh, it should, in fact, be the organized revolutionary vanguard of the class. And it should seek to politically hegemonize. Of course, you want it to be big, as big as possible, but program first. First you define the program, and then you recruit to it. Now, this is not applicable to very, very small groups saying, we are the party, join us. You know, uh, you, you need a political struggle where that becomes clear, not just to the handful of people who are presently involved in this group, that group, and the other group, but into a broader section of the population. Uh, on the other hand, those ideas are carried by particular organizations. And different organizations will have different things to contribute. If you look at the development of, Tr of Trotskyism in the United States, you'll find that Mustyites bring in something that the canon group didn't have previously, et cetera, et cetera. That's the process we're talking about. Um, finally, uh, in 1903, 1914, I think that in the, uh, short ex the short answer to that is that Lenin's practice went beyond his theory, essentially. And you know, that, that that's often going to be the case when we encounter new phenomena and new problems. It, it, if we're able to grope our way towards a solution, sometimes looking back on it, you theorize it, rather than look at the problem in the beginning, come up with the correct answer, and then implement that. I mean, you try to do that, but in the course of doing that, often you're going to retrospectively check it back. So that's the whole point about 1912. I, what we're saying, what Seymour says, and what most bourgeois historians and everybody else says, is that basically after that, there's only a name they have in common. There's two separate organizations, two separate programs. At that point, they were roughly similar size. In the next two years, the Bolsheviks were four times the size of the Mensheviks because they had a different orientation, not to act within the legal limits allowed by the Tsar, but to act illegally and to go out and make trouble for the Tsar. Turned out a lot of workers preferred that. So the Bolsheviks <laughs> grew faster than the Mensheviks as a result. Um, ben, and then this will actually have to be um, the last because we're at 4.17. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, see more consistent with bourgeois scholarship. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's, it's true of Cliff. Cliff has a, has a different uh, uh, particular take as well, but uh, as, as Lars has shown in terms of what is to be done, uh, but Cliff's whole discussion of 1903 is just basically drawn from either Menshevik or pro-bourgeois sources. And okay, maybe that's not a crime, and as I say, there are, there are riches in, uh, in, in bourgeois history, but I, I do think that fundamentally we do have to break with uh, the, the caricature that's been, uh, that's been presented. So the, for, as I say, for, the, for, the, uh, for a lot of the left and, and uh, the, the Cold War warriors, there's, there's an overlap that Len, Len him was some kind of manipulator and actually didn't quite say what he meant and uh, and all the rest of it. I think that's uh, if that as I say if that's if that's the case then sorry Lenin I'm not a Leninist you you you're a liar and a manipulator uh, I don't think that's how it works. Um, what has changed since the 1860s? I mean, I was just thinking in terms of 1860s. I mean, you did get Marx and Engels sitting in Engels' front room in London right in the program of the Party Ouvrier in 1878. Yeah, 1878, uh, uh, minimum maximum program, by the way, just for uh, Trotsky's comment. Uh, but uh, but you know they they sat and they did they did contribute as much as possible to the formation of mass Marxist parties in that time. The SPD was obviously the the breakthrough, and Engels did his did his bit as well. I think uh, one of the one of the re the real seeds of uh, of can germs of cancer in the SPD is the fact that they made a, they they actually did not take up seriously the demand for the democratic republic as the form of working class rule. Engels points that out in his critique, a very good text on the uh, the effort program, the critique of the effort program. 1891, excellent text, and he says, you know, this is this is a big flaw. Comes, we've got some wonderful demands, arm the people, elect the judges. But what does this all mean? What does it culminate in? And uh, Lenin, actually at the Second Congress, uh, 
refers to something Plokhanov said and said the, the SPD consciously adapt, uh, adopted to opportunist, uh, top opportunism from the start in that they didn't include dictation with the proletariat slash democratic republic in it. So, I, I, you know, it's not that uh, neo kautskyism is not saying, oh, if only the SPD, you know, it's, it's, we have to locate the, the sheer flaws in Kautskyism as well and how they reflect in, in some ways in Lenin, has to be said. Kautsky's understanding of the state, and I'm doing a lot of work on that at the moment, is flawed. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, I'm sure if Kautsky was here now, he'd have something to say about that. But I mean, I, I think I think it's uh, I think I think it's deeply flawed and and does feed into some of the positions he later later adopts. But that, so you say I've got a neo kautskyan position on on the on the, the, the party questions. I would say I have a neo leninist position on the on the party question because that's what Lenin looked to and uh, and, and other leading Bolsheviks. That was their model. There's a lovely quote in uh, 1912 again for people who are in, in doubt about uh, what Lenin's aims were. He uh, he's talking about how to organise under Stolypin's the July 3rd regime or the June 3rd regime? Anyway, Charlie Pin's kind of repressive regime in 1912, how do we operate, comrades, and what's the party going to do? And he actually writes an article after Prague saying, actually, the model we should look to, by the way, comrades, is how the SPD organised under Bismarck's anti-socialist law. So even in 1912, he's actually saying, yeah, this is how a party should, you know, the Red Postal Service, all that kind of stuff. He's even looking to the model in, there in, in 1912. That's a lovely little article about uh, the strength of SPD uh, organisation. So that, that's, uh, that's it. Will it build mass parties? Well, no, not overnight. I mean, that's, 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 that's quite clear, but I think the only way we, we can become mass is to break with an organisational bureaucratic form, which is a mini uh, uh, representation of the dictates of the labour bureaucracy actually, that, uh, that stifles uh, open political debate and culture and forces comrades into splits you know, you join the left, you have a disagreement, what are you going to do? Just, just literally, you know, how are you going to win the working class, the great unwashed masses who are corrupted by bourgeois? How are you going to win them to your ideas? You have to split. And this, this, unless we can break with that, comrades, this is, this is the fundamental point, whether you, whether you, uh, you know, agree with my particular take on 1912 and Kurt's Guild of Essex, the fundamental point is we organise in the most stupid, pathetic of fashions, right? We cannot unite ourselves, let alone the millions of people. I think we maybe have a, dis a, a, a disagreement on the scale. The millions of people we need to win to our banner to change the world. Marx and Engels' contribution to the understanding of socialism is the victory of democracy, the, 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 a conscious act of the overwhelming majority. We're not going to get anywhere near that if we continue to base ourselves on, quite frankly, uh, uh, as I say, fairy tale uh, uh, understandings of Bolshevism, which are tainted by the past. We need to break with that fundamentally, and only then can we seriously think about. It. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun, particularly. Uh, I don't think that you know, uh, Iskra and uh, the, in the 1890s and the early 1900s, uh, particularly under czarist repression and illegality, was the easiest of uh, political climates to operate in. But they did it because they were serious politicians who wanted a political party. And I don't think the left is serious at the moment, actually, about political party. It contents itself with being silly little groups that, have, that actually have very little influence on anything and the danger exists that we disappear up our own backside, to use a lovely uh, English phrase, and, and just simply become millinery and sex who run around. And, and that's, that's, that's not good, right? We have to go, why are we here? And I, I have put forward at least uh, some, some explanation. I'm not saying I have the answers particularly, but unless we break with the models that we've inherited, which are anti-working class, which are, for, uh, which are forms and manifestations of the labour bureaucracy, we will not go anywhere. And I think that's the fundamental thing that I'm certainly doing in terms of my research and political work, looking back to these things about how we can go forward. Bolshevism is rich in history uh, and has some, some wonderful lessons that we can draw on in order uh, uh, to move forward. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. I could join the IBD tomorrow, I disagree with them on something, then I have well, to go and form the... Well, exactly. So, you know, it's, just, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's frankly uh, uh, childish and not up to the task that are thrown our way today in this, in this period. Okay, we need to wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Good, good discussion. Same about Fambi. I, I didn't really go on into Fambi's side. I do have criticism. I think he's uh, he, he underestimates. No, it's of, hard also, and you know, with him not participating, then yeah. You know, I, I think his thing is a bit. Let's all get together. He kind of underestimates the strategic differences, which there are. But, but I mean, I mean, the, there's, there's obviously a continuum of like what becomes sort of politically acceptable. Like, yeah. Sure. I mean, so like. <laughs> I, I guess the, the feeling is like 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 there's a way in which like, in some ways like organization built most of it should be but but I feel like like there's this kind of self delusion thing like in the present moment that if you try to build a party in the place the CPG is doing 
But uh, you know, time was very limited. Yeah. Planning and yeah. managing, uh, like fifteen years, as there is to have a massive uh, uh, shop development. The, shop the, will, the world's moved on, but the, the problem is uh, the way we're organised at the moment is that being a major factor my the entrance is very good. Inside the Soviet Union, the fact that neither is anywhere else. What kind of basis do you have? I don't know how many years exactly, but they have not long term. Is it that the objective conditions are falling, or the other? On the left, um, or also self criticism uh, has been made within so your party, for example, like, you know, that maybe you your subjective approach is also responsible for not <laughs> managing to do what you No, we, you know, to a we so think that so there, are, maybe there are historical opportunities to present themselves. You have to, you have, that's so the, the framework within like which you operate. The smaller you are, the less you're able to control the environment. If you're a very small organization, if you recruit one person, three people, that's a big deal. If you're a big group, if you have a thousand people, you recruit three or you lose three, it doesn't matter much. Uh, in the United States, if a group began to exist in 1963, it had different possibilities than it has today. Then if it began in 1970,